Welcome everybody to another Archie Junkie video. Today we're going to do a quick overview of what's 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 in the box and what does it do for the Bier Infrared Light Module, the SMIR162. This is the unit here. It would typically go in the trailer of your radio controlled project model and um, receive the infrared signals from the Bier SFR1 or the USM RC2 by the little IR receiver here. You then get the option for connecting the 16 outputs up to the various options you have. Some of the connections will mirror some of the connections from the SFR1 and some you can set individually. Uh, we'll go very quickly through those in the manual of what's what. Uh, just to give you an indication of size of the unit, we're looking at roughly 67 millimeters long by 55 millimeters wide or that way high whichever way you wish to look at it and this way we're looking at in the region of say 17 18 millimeters now obviously you will need to allow a little bit more room to be able to get to the connectors get to the dip switches get to the actual timer control pots here the little p1 and p2 pots as they refer to they are for controlling extra light outputs functions and speed as say we'll go through those very quickly so my arms wobbling and we also have here connections one and two so you can connect two servos to this so you could use the servo say for a rear steer axle uh, or you could use the servo to actually operate an arm you have two functions now depending on the load of your servos it's depending whether you directly connect all three cables to here or just the signal but we'll go through that in the manual it does explain what's what the dip switches are for setting different light functions some of the functions i believe the first 12 light functions will mirror from the USM RC2 and the SFR1 and then the other four outputs can be set individually on this board and as I say we will go through what they are. So they are your connections on the board. We have our voltage in, we have our lights out, our two servos, our two timer control pots, dip switch selector and we also have a hole here which goes right through the board for a mounting so I'm guessing you can do and there as well. So there's one just here and there's one just there. Now one's accessible, the other one's not, but we go from there. So what you will need with this is the infrared receiver. Now the red one is receive and the blue one on the SFR1 is transmit. Now they're shown in the manual and they are fairly obvious which one's which. Now what it can be a bit of a mystery of where it is, is on the side of the unit here. I don't know if you can see there, in German it's written brown, rot and orange. Okay, now that obviously is brown, red and orange. So we have our infrared cable here and we have our three pins here. So we just need to make sure we follow those there. Brown being negative, red being positive and orange being signal or sine wave as it's shown here on the signal. So that's typically connecting that up there. We will then go through the voltage in there. So referring to the manual, I'll leave the unit up here and we can refer back to it if we need to. We will just go through very quickly what's in here. You get the table of contents, usual sort of thing. Description of what the unit does. Um, so as it goes through here, as I very briefly, very briefly explained, but I say we'll go through a little bit more detail. The IR, the SM IR162 has 16 switch outputs, e.g. lamps and LEDs. 12 of these outputs copy the 12 switch options from the USM RC2 and the SFR1. It's not written in this manual, but it does. These different functions have their four outputs. So the extra four outputs have additional functions, which can be one to four channels, which can be an all round light, a four to eight channel chaser light and different flashes. We will go through and I'll explain briefly what they're referring to there later in the manual. Additionally, the 16 switch outputs are these two server outputs, which can control different movements. These can be used for either trailer support legs, locking or unlocking seat post, 
I'm guessing they mean like a, an arm, controlling or tipping movement of a dump truck and many other functions. So because they are server outputs, you can obviously connect an ESC to them. Uh, now bearing in mind, ESCs also have BEC circuits in or battery eliminator circuits in them. So just be cautious of that. It is explained in the manual what you need to do if you do have that. Um, but you could actually connect a electronic speed control there and then run maybe even a smoke generator. Why you'd want smoke in your trailer and not in your truck, I don't know, but depends how the project works for you. So going through the technical data, I shall just lift this down a bit now. We're actually looking at this in a little bit more detail. So supply voltage, five to 14 volts DC. The current consumption is 25 milliamps. So we have 16 pieces. It's a minus switching. The amount of output voltage corresponds to the supply voltage. So that basically means whatever voltage you put in, you'll get out of your light outputs and they are negative switched. So they have a common positive and a negative switch. So the negative is what controls whether they flash, dim, or whichever functions you assign. Light function 12 outputs the same as the USM RC2 or the SFR1. One channel and four channel all round light. Four different flash or four to eight channel and chaser light. Servo outputs, two pieces. Maximum consumption of servos is 600 milliamps. Now that refers to the red and black cables which go to your servo. So if you are using a heavy metal gear servo to move an arm and it exceeds more than 600 milliamps, you're gonna to need to run the red and black cable of the servo direct to the battery supply or to another supply and only connect the signal cable. So you'll get the signal from the actual unit, but the actual supply voltage for the servo will come from a a supply with a greater current allowance, should we say. So we have an operating temperature, a maximum degree, and as you said, the dimensions, so I wasn't far off, 6755 by 17 and a weight of 35 grams. This then goes through to explain what the dip switches are. We have eight dip switches. So we have an all round light chaser, one to four channel, chaser four channel or eight channel, chaser option, reverse inverting of the two servos so if you do connect the steering and you want your trailer legs to steer the opposite direction to your truck all you need to do is flip the dip switch on five or six depending on you're on or off seven is reverse and eight must always be turned off so i'm not sure what eight is for but it always must be turned off so terminal assignment so this is the terminal assignment here so this Obviously, if we look at it like this, is the unit there. So we have our one to eight outputs and our nine to 16 outputs go that way. So one to eight goes down, nine to 16 goes up. So on this unit here, unlike some of the other units like the SFR1, we actually have a negative and positive for each terminal. The SFR1 uses two common positives on one bank and then another two common positives on another bank and then all the other negative switches are individual cables so here you, if you've got a two wire led you can connect those two wires straight to it bearing in mind when you connect your led you need to bear in mind what wattage your led is and what voltage you're supplying into it i.e what 5 to 14 volts you're putting you will need the corresponding resistor depending on your voltage so if you're running 7.2 nickel metal hydride in and you're running a whatever wattage resistor you're running, you, sorry, LED you're running, you'll need to make sure you have the appropriate resistor in place. Now there is calculation charts online and it does very briefly go through it in the manual, just to bear that in mind. So that's our outputs there, that's our inputs. We have our P1, our P2, our, pot, our two servos and two mounting holes in the IR receiver. So they are just labeled here. So, excuse me one second. So your terminal assignments. So your terminal assignments are labelled here. So X1 plus a negative. So that is X1 is over here. So you can just about see there's a little X1 there. X2 is this bank. X3 is this bank. And then we have X4, 1 is just written here. I don't know if you can see that. It's just there, 4, 1. We then have X51 and X52 are written there. They're quite small, but that refers to X51 and 2 here. So we have 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5. So we have 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5. 
So going on to the next page, they give you an example of a typical connection wiring diagram. So you can see on here we have our infrared receiver connected. We have one servo connected, which is up to 0.6 amps or 600 milliamps. We have our 5 to a 14 volts DC. Now they recommend that you run that through a 3 amp fuse on the positive side. So if you do inadvertently do something, you've got a good chance of blowing the fuse. But bearing in mind, as it says, all connections must be done with the unit turned off. Any connections you make, you're responsible for. There is no circuit protection or no overload protection on any of these LED circuits. So if you connect a battery up to here instead of an LED and you blow the unit, that is your responsibility. The unit warranty will literally need to be covered for faults with the unit, like it's not functioning properly, not operating as expected. But BM yeah, sure will sort you out either way, whichever way you need to know. They'll let you know if it's your fault or their fault. So the supply voltage connection connection must be between 5 and 14 volts, e.g. battery to X1. Please make sure the polarities are correctly connected. So you can see on here, output 1, if we have here, that little symbol is a diode symbol. The arrow is coming off means it emits light. That's a light emitting diode. So you can see here on the negative, we have a diode. The little square part there or rectangle is a resistor. And then we have the positive. So we have the positive going through the resistor through the negative. It doesn't matter which side you put the resistor on of an LED. It just needs to be there to limit the current going to it. An LED will only pass current in one direction. So it, Whichever side you put it on, it doesn't matter, the resistor will work either way. So we have output 1 to 8 there, and 9 to 16 here. Okay, so that's the basic wiring diagram. So, this part here, connecting lamps LEDs to the switch outputs. Lamps are connected to terminals as we saw, X2, X3, X2, X2, and X3, 1, and X3, 16. Uh, so these terminals are sprung tension terminals which allow for quick and easy connection of the light module. To disconnect or to connect or disconnect the cable, simply press down the terminal. So let's just go, I'll just go on to here very quickly. I should just get a little metal rod I have here. So you can see here, if I can get that in shot, there is like a little sprung arm there. And if I can get the light to go down the arm, down the hole, that pushing it down will push and release it. Now you can obviously push this with your fingernail, or just get a little screwdriver on there and push it down. Now, one thing I was going to say in my little build video, but I'll go through it now, is it might be worth for peace of mind, as you can see here, terminal one is negative and then terminal 3, so obviously 1, 3, 5, 7, 9, 11, 11, 13 and 15 are all negatives. So what you may want to do is get yourself a sharpie. So we know that, as we said, we know that 1 is negative. So what you may want to do is just put a little black line on there. So then you can do 3, 5, 7, 9, 11, 13, and 15. Now, by all means, you could put a red one in between, but as long as you've got an idea of which ones you're negative, just at a glance, you can see which one's negative because the terminals are all the same color and it's quite difficult to see between there and there. So they're all, they're labeled one to 15, but there is 16 because it, it starts at one and ends at 16. And this side, they're actually labeled the same. So even though the outputs are, one to nine on here. Sorry. <clears throat> one to eight on here and nine to sixteen on here. They're not lumbered with their actual outputs, they're just numbered in pin alignment. So bear that in mind. You're not going to put a cable in one here and one here, two here and two here. It's one and two is one LED. Three and five three three and four is another LED. So I just wanted to point that out to you. There's a little quick tip for you. So back to the manual. So as it says, it goes through using spring loaded connectors. So the switch voltage of 16 outputs is always as high as the supply voltage. So as we showed earlier, 
whatever you put in is what you're going to get out. So they go through basically explaining the difference between supply, supply voltage, wattage and current. So using the calculation of Ohm's law, you can sure you can watch some fascinating video on YouTube about Ohm's law. We have an example here of a typical power voltage of 7.2. So that would cover most people that are going to run nickel metal hydrides. Now obviously LiPo is a 7.4, so you're going to have to allow for that small increase in voltage, but there's not a huge in it. And we want to connect a white LED with a 3.5 volt 20 milliamp supply. Now bear in mind different LEDs different colored LEDs do actually have different wattage ratings. There's not a huge difference in them, but there is, so just bear that in mind. The other option is to always err on the side of caution, always put slightly more resistance than you need. More resistance means your lights would just be a little bit dimmer, but they'd also be a little bit safer. Um, you also get more lamp life out of them, so you will get more running life out of them. By running an LED at its maximum brightage, you are will reduce its lamp lifetime. Um, but LEDs are so cheap and they run for thousands of hours, you're unlikely to burn one out in its lifetime. So as you can see here, we're using a white LED with a 3.5 volts, 20 milliamp. So we have 7.2 divided by 3.5. So the resistance equals 1.85. So that's current. So that's a supply voltage divided by the current voltage by the resistance and then you get the ampage. So you can see here that it's 0.02 amps, which is 20 milliamps. That's Ohm's law, which is to find the resistance, you have to divide current by voltage. Don't quote me on that. You need to check it yourself. So as you can say here, so however, since the resistance is 185 ohms and it's not possible to use the nearest possible value in case of 180 ohms. So they're actually going down, but I would personally could probably go up to 200 ohms or even maybe a 220 ohm resistor. Just in case you decide to suddenly switch to LiPo, you're going to have a little bit more coverage. Subsequently, one should be used, one should be used to calculate the necessary resistance value. So P goes through, I'm not going through maths, this is not my strong point. So just bear in mind you need a resistor for each LED and calculate the right one. If you need help, there's loads of online calculators, other online help. If not, say always err on the side of caution. Connecting servos. So two servos can be connected. Just go down a bit, excuse me. Two servos can be connected to X51 and X52. So again, they're just saying here, attention, the maximum cut must not exceed 600 milliamps before connecting. Please check the technical spec of your servos. If you want to use tires with a servos of a higher voltage, then you need to supply the voltage separately. So this is where I was saying what they've done here is they've cut the positive. So you're no longer getting the positive supply from the actual the actual IR board. You're getting the positive supply from the main battery supply. So most circuit boards all use a common negative. So whatever comes in negative here runs around a common negative for every negative terminal, apart from these switching outputs uh, to here. So this is why you do not need to connect the negative separately. You could do by all means and just have the positive, but it's actually better to have a common negative positive going direct from the supply voltage so we're now supplying say 7.2 volts to our servo and we're actually getting the negative from the board the positive from the direct battery supply and the orange is the signal wire now please bear in mind if you're doing this and you're going to run 7.2 volts into here you need to make sure your servo will cater for 7.2 volts or you're going to need to have some kind of way of reducing the voltage to this servo now you may need to put in a UBEC or get a higher voltage servo or cater for that. So just to bear that in mind, you can run servos direct off the board, but not too much. So ideally, they're really suited for running ESCs because ESCs don't draw hardly any milliamps. And therefore, whatever your ESC can capable of running is what output you could run. Connecting the IR diode. So basically, connect it to the board and enable it in the sound teacher to make sure it's communicating. Connecting the IR diode, basically connect it to the board as we show through here. The receiver can easily connect it to X1, X41, which is that board there we saw earlier. So we'll go through that when we actually set the unit up. I'm just basically running through page by page on the manual just to show you what's what. So outputs 1 to 12. So 1 to 12 are a copy of the 12 outputs on the USM RC2. Now there is explained in that manual how to operate that as well. 
This means that every time an output switches on on the USM RC2, the same output switches on on the SMIR16 too also. So an example would be output number one and two, maybe left and right turn signal. So when your left and right turn signals come on respectively on a truck, they will also come on on your trailer. So you will have lights which operate in sequence. Some people who run additional receivers or different units or even say Bluetooth links, they may have some latency or different flash rates. Now, visually, that doesn't really matter because most people look at the back of the trailer and you can see the turn signal is flashing. But if you want that nice scale look where your turn signals are consistent down the side of the vehicle, so from the front to the side door marker light, to the rear of the truck, to the front or to the side markers, say down your trailer, to the rear lights of your trailer, these would all flash in sequence. And the same for brake lights. Brake lights will come on simultaneously. When you turn your headlights, they will come on. Headlights aren't so important because once they're on, they're on. But lights are turned on and off. You can clearly see the sequence. So, example would be 10 on the sound unit. Is the blinker right? So as we showed here. So it just mirrors the blinker unit. So this is if you're referring to the caution again. The 16 switch outputs are not short circuit proof. A short circuit or overload will destroy the outputs and is not covered under the warranty. So just bear that in mind. So outputs 13 to 16. So we have 1 to 12 that are mirroring the SMR, the SFR1 or the USMRC2. We also now have four additional outputs, 13 to 16. So these four outputs, 13 to 16, have different specified light functions. They have an all-round light. Now that refers to as like a, a rotating beacon light. So when they say all round, it means like four lights working in sequence to provide light all round. Just as, in case you didn't understand what they're referring to there. We also have a blinker and flasher and a chaser light. So you could use it for if you wanted the blinker lights to go back and forth, or say if you wanted a strobe lights on the rear of a trailer. So if you're typically pulling plant equipment on your trailer and you want like a strobe light or a beacon light on the rear of your trailer, or one in the corner of the trailer rotating around, you have those options to run there. You do not need to use your 12 outputs of your sound and light module, excuse me, I'm pointing up here, your 12 outputs of your sound and light module to operate that light. You can run them off directly off the four outputs off the back of the unit here. So I will go through these when I power the unit up and we'll do like a little demo test on the bench explaining which, how these light functions work and how they go through. So we have here one to channel all round light, four pieces. So as they said here, it refers to a rotating all round light. So these total four pieces on one channel all round light. The four speeds are all of the all round light are purposefully set as different speeds. They are not synchronized. So you, to control them, you basically control here. The speed of the one channel all round lights can be adjusted by P1. So pot number one up here, blue and arm, P1 has a little screw now if you are going to turn these make sure you do turn them with the right size screwdriver ideally use a plastic screwdriver if you have one and turn them slowly they should only be turned very slowly for very small micro adjustments if you turn them a lot they will become loose and any vibrations means those movements may move and you may have a different setting so just treat them gently and turn them slowly so we also have four channel all round light one pieces and then we also, again, it goes through using the trimmer pot. We have flasher and blinker, four pieces. The flashes and blinkers are activated on the outputs 13 to 16, as we said, one to 12 of the other unit, 13 to 16 of the rest. So we have here, output 13 is a short flash impulse, 14, short double impulse, 15, short double light impulse, chronologically offset to 14. So to me, that sounds like that this pulse is on when that pulse is off, but we'll go through and we'll see how that works. Output 16 is blinker. And then we also have the option to set it as a chaser light. So either four channel or eight channel. Four channel chaser light can be created by the four outputs 13 to 16. Outputs 19 to 12 also can be also used for eight channel chaser lights. These outputs cannot be um, acuted from the sound module. So again, we'll go through that. So you just need to change the dip switch depending on what you want the light to do. So dip switch S12 off is a four channel chaser light on outputs 13 to 16. If you switch it on, it's an eight channel light, but it uses outputs nine to 16. 
So, two different operating options can be set by dip switch number three. So you can have the chaser light runs in one direction or you can run back and forth. So that's like a chasing effect going across. So you'll get one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, or you'll get the light run back and forth. So you get one, two, three, four, four, three, two, one. One, two, three, four, four, three, two, one. So a bit like if you want a nice uh, beacon or strobe effect. Activation of the four special lights function is done through the actual USM RC teacher and the channels Nautic switch or the EKFM one module. We'll go through that how to switch them here. So controlling the servos. Two servos can be connected to the light module and two servos can be controlled separately. So on the SFR1 there is an option for controlling the servos via the functions on that unit there where you have more options than you have here. Um, but you can certainly use them direct from here. So here's here, the programming positions can be acted via the free function configuration in the USM RT2 or the SFR1 sound teacher via the proportional channels, the Nautic switch or the EFK, so excuse me, EKMFA module, mode, sorry, switch inputs. So that's just a very quick brief run through of the manual, what the unit does and what it looks like. The manual is, just for instance, for the hell of it, 12 pages long, so it's not too bad. A lot of that is warning specifications and table of contents. And that there is the unit itself. And so say, we will go through a little, let me just take the shine off of that for you. We will go through a little on-bench build test. And I'm going to be using the unit in conjunction with a SFR1, which is here. Please excuse the mess of wires. Okay. And you can see here on the SFR1, the actual infrared transmitter is just looks like an LED. It is a specialist LED that does actually have three wires and it connects to this port here. So that one is blue and the other one is red. So this one has a forward face. So this needs to be here. On your truck and this needs to be pointing towards it now you might be able to put this at 90 degrees and allow the light to come from the side but it's probably better to have it directly facing now in the manual they do actually say that these should be no more than 10 centimeters apart so we're looking at like that and bearing in mind also if you are putting this on a trailer it's going to need to be able to see this as well so you can't necessarily put them at an opposite angle like this because as the trailer turns you're then going to take it out of say out of view it may still work, it may not. So the best practice is probably better to put this right in the middle of the back of your truck and put this somewhere underneath where the fifth wheel connects, where they've got clear vision towards each other, but no obstruction in between, no hanging cables, nothing else. So as your ta trailer turns, it's really only gonna turn around that axis like that. So you're still gonna get vision so that your infrared signal is not interrupted. And the a little ESC that I couldn't put my hand on a moment ago is this one here. This is the MFR 2010, 1210, sorry. This has, here we have our supply voltage, our motor outputs, and our servo connection. So please bear in mind that this is a proper ESC in a sense this actually does have a BEC circuit in it. So this will put out a supply voltage from the battery. So if we put 7.2 volts into here it will typically probably put 6 volts out the red and brown wire and you can't connect that directly to this unit. You will need to remove either one of the positive or the negative ideally both of them because what you will end up doing is putting this supply voltage from here into this board when this already has a, as we know, up to 600 milliamp supply voltage out of there. So you don't want to put an in to an out. So you only really need the signal cable if that's the case. This is obviously optional if you're going to use it in a different module, in a different model, excuse me. Um, you'd obviously plug this directly into your receiver and then from the battery and this would power your receiver. So if you wanted to put one of these in the trailer, and have a receiver in your trailer, a second receiver, this would actually power your receiver from the main supply. So hopefully that covers 
a bit about this unit and what you can and can't do with it. And as I say, we will go through and do a little bench mock-up test soon. And um, thanks for watching. Uh, please like and subscribe, hit the bell notification, and I'll catch you in the next video. Thanks for watching.